Hello and welcome to Sales Academy Showcase with your host, Adam Brooks. Uh, Sales Academy Showcase is a show where we interview leaders in business to, to get underneath, to go a little deeper, to kind of learn a bit more about the people behind the brands that they've built. Uh, and I'm a huge fan of podcasts, so I will say this, podcast safely. Listening to engaging content can distract you from your daily life. But no animals or business leaders were harmed in the making of these shows yet. So today we have the pleasure of uh, a conversation with, with Leslie Shelley uh, of Davis, Davies, sorry, Business Consultancy, uh, an accountancy firm which, with a bit of a twist and a bit of a difference, and I'd like, to, I'd like Leslie to explain that and explore that with us a little bit further, but I believe Leslie is an individual who has an awesome business and an inspiring, inquisitive mind. Uh, I always gauge my kind of business relationships, and most relationships really, on someone I'd like to hang out with is, would I like to have a beer with them? And Les is one of those kind of people. She challenges my thinking, and I love the sessions when we get together and we do that. So I'll let Leslie introduce herself in a bit more detail as we do that. But firstly, can you just take us back a little bit, Leslie? And can you just tell our listeners how we first met? Okay, so <clears throat> I first heard about Sales Academy at Stroudnet. Um, yeah. I kind of came to a networking event and. I think Adam, you did a presentation from the front on that one, and I was I was intrigued. Um, I've always had a business coach, um, but how you kind of presented was was really intriguing. And and then you kind of go away and you don't think about it. Yeah. And I went away, and and other things happened, and I was running a business, and and then things fell apart with my business, and suddenly my first port of call was. I'm going to ring sales Academy. It was, I think I'd, Amanda had been at something and it was just, it was fresh in my memory at that point in time. Um, and I rang Amanda and she was brilliant on the phone and we arranged to meet. And I think I came down to Chepstow and we met and you were there as well. And it was just kind of, that was kind of the first time that we kind of sat down had a conversation and I was in a mess, but I mean, you were great. You were just, both really understanding and, and really helped me to kind of put my feet back on the floor really and, and to start cool. making some progress. Wow, wow. So quite an emotional <laughs> first, first <laughs> yeah. that, that first meeting was quite because it was like, okay, so what's happened? And a lot had happened, right? Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. get into some of that maybe as we uh, as as we kind of digress a little bit more. So okay. Um yeah, and it's straight net. We all missed driving that. There were some brilliant events there that we that we ran with Robin. Um, so I want to find out a little bit about you as well. So if I can ask questions in the conversation and drill down a little bit further on some of these questions as we do. But um, what were you doing before you're doing what you're doing now? Tell us a little bit about you. Let's go into the background a bit, Leslie. Uh, so going to sort of the history, um, my kind of career started in hospitality. Um, I trained as a hotel and restaurant manager and worked in hotels, restaurants, cafes, pubs, um, all the way through university and out the other sides. Um, yeah. Worked in a hotel was my first job after graduating. Um, but I, I had a passion for numbers. Um, I developed that when I was at university in my placement year, um, got into the finance team there and loved it. Absolutely loved it love sorting problems, solving issues, um, and feeling like you're really helping a business. Mm. Um, they offered me a full-time position. Um, I like to finish things. So I went back to, uni I declined that and actually went back to university to finish my degree. Um, but I majored on everything finance in my degree. It was kind of like you could pick and choose modules. It was, it was really nice in that sense. And I did my dissertation on outsourcing the finance function. Um, there weren't any books written about outsourcing at that point. Um, I think that actually there was one that was written in the 1970s. Um, so, but so it wasn't relevant anyway. Yeah. No, it wasn't relevant at all. I had a fantastic tutor who got me into, um, uh, who was it? Deloitte, I think in London, um, got me into their archives mm. so I could go through all their journals and, and stuff on outsourcing. Um, brilliant day um, just delving through and researching stuff and really loved it um, so finished my degree 
And then, as I say, I worked in a hotel, but I was like, what am I going to do? I want to do finance. I want to get out of this. Um, so I kind of went in on my days off and worked with a financial controller and learned as much as I could on my days off, um, just working and, and doing stuff for them. And then I'd go in and do my normal job. And then I decided to start training. So I started my four year course training as an accountant. Yeah. Um, needed to get kind of experience. So I moved around, I worked for Capita. Um, yeah, that was an interesting experience. Um, wouldn't go back, but it was, you know, it, it helped and it showed me a lot of different things um, at Capita in terms of how to deal with clients and how not to deal with clients. Yeah. Um, and then I worked in insurance for a little bit, got a really nice job in PR um, worked in their finance department with a fantastic finance director, really great mentor, um, taught me a lot. Um, and I was due to take over from him. Um, but the MD decided to retire and, and everything changed. And I got approached to open a hotel down in Cardiff um, as the financial controller. So I took that because um, the, the outlook for that was to be sort of a regional financial controller of hotels with sort of 10 to 15 hotels that I'd manage. Yeah. Um, but again, it didn't come off. They were an Irish company, I'd never been in the UK before, and they, it wasn't the same. They couldn't replicate what they'd done over in Ireland in the UK. And they realized that and they didn't open another one. They just kept the one. So I moved, tried to get a job more locally because that was a, an hour and 10 minute commute. Um, mm. I had two young children at that point. And I just, I wasn't seeing them. I was leaving at five in the morning. I was getting home at half six, seven at night. Right. Um, and it just, it just out. wasn't, yeah, not a good lifestyle. I wouldn't see the kids during the week really. Um, so I managed to land a job in a marketing firm in Ross. I could walk to work. Wow. So I started That's work crazy. at nine. Yeah, <laughs> I started work at nine and I was home at half past five. Um, so I could, you know, I had time with the kids in the morning and I had time when I got back. Um, which was lovely but um, yeah things went a bit pear-shaped there um, the MD was a bit I, I didn't agree with his ethics um, he wasn't a great sort of manager he'd run a business it would get into trouble he'd close it and then start another one yeah and it was he was putting people out of business because he wasn't paying for things and I was just like no I don't agree with this I can't work for you anymore so I just had my third child and I was like I'm going to do my own thing and, and that's kind of where it stemmed from. Me and a friend sat in Starbucks and we said, let's do it. And that was kind of, that was kind of the turning point. Fab, fab. You've already spoken about, um, and, and I think this will come out more and more and more, you're, uh, you're very strong in your values and they're big drivers for you in terms of, there's, there's I, I find a lot of people are happy to compromise themselves over their values and it's something I'm really proud to say that you stand really true to in terms of your decisions in your life as well as your business from what I've seen of you already and what I've experienced with you already and you've had some challenging times Leslie in that in that short period and to, uh, to operate with grace and dignity and authenticity through that it, it is a real test of your character and who you are as a person and your ethos and your values that you live you don't just talk about it you live them yeah so some of those changes that you made in your career they're all great experiences and stuff like that like, but when when you and you you may flippantly say that that kind of didn't work out so that when it really compromises you you're not gonna you're not gonna be part of that no you know so and it's it's one of the joyous but we don't necessarily realize it maybe at the time but when we become unemployable yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I think that is very, very true um, in terms of you can't go back to working for someone else. Or if you did, the person that you end up working for has got to have the same values yeah. and work ethics and, and have that same mindset. And I think that's really difficult to find in an employer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you have, to, you have to create it if it doesn't exist, yeah. right? The same yeah. as the other thing. And like you said, when you work for those inspirational leaders, those motivational, those great mentors, they, they challenge you and champion you at the same yeah. time. But they're lesser than them. So cool. Okay. So 
it's a little bit of background in terms of what you were doing beforehand. So um, what inspired you to get into this? So you said you had the coffee conversation and stuff and you couldn't do things anymore, but what, what really inspired you to do accountancy and the, your own practice and to take it in the direction that you have? I think initially the thing that stopped me is probably quite key in the fact that I was scared to branch out on my own. Mm. Um, as a trained management accountant, I was trained to work in industry, not to work in practice. Um, so in that sense, it was more that it needed to have a real drive to, to push that sort of boundary of saying actually I can do practice I may not be able to do everything in practice and I think the real driving force was was family um, yeah. in the sense of having that kind of balance um, of being able to be around for my kids and be able to do stuff with my kids have the flexibilities around the holidays but also I could then decide how I operated with my clients yeah. So in that sense, I, I brought with, with me the corporate uh, mentality of management accounting yeah. in that you, you review your accounts regularly um, so that you have constant visibility of your numbers to know how your business is doing and whether you need to make any changes. And this, this might seem odd, right? But we've laughed about this a few times. Yeah. Because in the, in the small business world and, and like it's like in retail, they cash up at the end of the shift, right? In, in hotels, in pubs, they cash up at the end of the shift. But in service-based industries, we wait to sit down with the accountant at the end of the year to see how we've done. And it's, it, that seems such an acceptable practice from what are a pen, potentially an advisory board that we go to. Accountants are like the trusted advisor almost that we, we, we look for. And some of that advice is sit down once a year. So that's some of how you guys are very different. Yeah. In terms of how the, the, the proactive and the, and the, the approach to, to doing it regular. So when you said practice, not in, uh, sorry, you, you, you were schooled to learn to work in industry, not practice, just for our listeners, what, what do you mean by that? Um, I think because there's, there's two major differences in terms of the professional body that you follow in terms of how you get trained. So, my professional body is very much industry based and you train them to work in those finance departments within companies. Um, and, and I guess um, practice is very much seen as accountants who are trained in audit. So they're kind of your auditors, whereas for my qualification, we didn't have to do any form of audit because in an industry, you never do an audit yourselves. You always have to get an external body to come in and do the audit. Yeah. So I never learned audit. So now I can't work with some solicitors who deal with client money. Yeah. Because legally, there is a legal framework that says um, they have to use auditor based accountancy practice. OK. And we're not we're not that. So we're kind of a bit restricted um, in that. But it's it's more in the law. And I think our professional body are now trying to move away, move that and mm. and get us recognized that actually we can do the level of work and we can sign off on accounts there's no reason why we can't yeah but we would never undertake an audit but that's something completely different anyway okay okay so where so in terms of thank you for explaining that a little bit a little bit further because it just helps when people aren't in the same industry with, with it's easy to slip into any terms or jargon and stuff. So I may question a couple of times of last right just to explain things. Yeah, um, no, that's fine. So your approach then, which is much more hands-on cash flow management and all that sort of stuff. So why do you believe in that so much? Why is it so important to you? And almost take that to another stage in terms of why do you do this as a business? Why is it so important to you that you put all your time and energy into it as a business? I think for me, it's bringing that accountancy department into the small business hmm. because small businesses and, and it's the same with marketing and sales and everything else um, in a large corporate environment you'd have a department for each area and you'd have specialists for each area um, in a small business you don't and 
as we know working through stuff in in sales academy you know we we are not good at everything mm. and we need support from different people for different things and i think bringing that sort of corporateness into how i deal with my clients how i educate my clients in having the visibility that they need to make good decisions um, to keep their business healthy um, it's just bringing a few tools that in corporate world you wouldn't even think about they're just there you use them all the time but it seems you know that that when someone starts a business they don't think about it they don't think about sort of how how much cash they need how how that sort of generates how it sort of is the lifeblood of the business how it flows through and and those kind of things and they don't really then see how they can project and forecast and, and make better decisions to be able to function more efficiently and effectively. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. You did a brilliant workshop for, for the sales Academy family recently where you, you kind of broke it down into three sections, didn't you? Which was, can you just remind, I know the, 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 the listeners weren't there, but if you can just remind, cause I think everybody needs to hear this message because it's so you put it across so simply and you broke a business down into these elements. So yeah, so I guess, you know, when people are starting out, they kind of, they need to think about how they want to set up their business. So that first section was just looking at all the different entities. So your sole trader, your partnership, your limited company, and what were the pros and cons of, of each one, just to kind of give people an idea of, of which, which one suits their business best, where should they start? Um, and there might be some really obvious things that kind of make it, yes i need to go as a sole trader or yes i need to be a limited company there might be some key things in there that they haven't even thought about yeah. um and so that you know that was kind of just giving people a little bit of education there um second session sort of being the cash flow which as i said is the lifeblood of the business but i think a lot of people look at their business and look at the profit and the profit isn't cash they kind of think oh you know i've made 10 grand profit but i haven't i've got 50 quid in the bank why why is it so different yeah. and i think it was just kind of educating people on on the difference and showing them how they can monitor it yeah and then how they can use it to to make it better for their business um yeah. in that sense um and the final one i shared was about a book i'd read um called profit first um, which, you know, it, it's had a massive influence for me. Yeah. Um, but I just shared sort of the instant assessment of how you can assess how your company is doing now mm. at this precise second um, and where it should be um, in comparison to, you know, someone who's researched and looked at thousands and thousands of firms across the world. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that was kind of the, the mind-blowing eye-opener for a lot of people. Yeah, because you were talking about, you know, Robert Kiyosaki talks about it in the cash flow quadrant and all that sort of stuff about how do we, you know, pay ourselves first when we're self-employed and when we start on a business, you go from being paid last to being paid first. And it's kind of okay in principle, but it doesn't really work out and show the mechanics to the level that profit first does. I'm sure the book will come up a couple of times in conversation, but it really does break that down. And, you know, you mentioned just then about, um, I haven't made the profit yet. I remember somebody said to me from, a, they were looking at recruiting, they needed some extra team members and they said, I will do, but I, I, I need to make profit first. And I, mem I remember questioning, I said, so are you looking to pay for your staff from your profit? And, and, the, and the question just stopped them in their tracks and they were like, well, no, the profit's for me. And I'm like, so why are you waiting? You know, the whole gearing, the yeah. whole thinking around their gearing, around their <laughs> financial infrastructure, it was just, it was, almost restrictive it was holding them back it was paralyzing them effectively yeah no? so okay cool so in terms of um your dreams and your goals in your life and stuff they've they've changed and evolved as well so why are you in terms of why are you doing it why is it so important where's the passion come from how does that fit then in terms of you running your own business and your lifestyle now yeah i guess it's quite different um when I started, it was more about sort of helping people with their finances and there's, and it's still got that element to it. And I'm still passionate about helping small businesses, but I think as time has gone on, it's, it's more in the sense of a, a lifestyle thing now. So, um, I don't want to be working 70, 80 hours a week, taking on every client that approaches me and, yeah. and 
you know, helping all of them, I, I've got to the point now where I can pick and choose who I work with. Yeah. Um, and I've got other aspirations. We, you know, we've got a massive house project, hopefully in the next couple of years. Yeah. Um, plus investing into property as well. So I'm kind of branching out to try and generate different streams of income rather than just solely relying on, on the business, which can be quite demanding. Um, yeah. if I was just to grow that, um, solely. Yeah. Well, working on making money work for you as opposed to working for money as well. It's a big part yeah. in that shift in, the, in terms of the identity. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask a question about how, how people or why people would need your services in their lives. I'll come back to that one if I can, because, um, let's talk about some myths and some horror stories and some, you know, cause accountancy and finances and the tax man and all these kinds of, I'm not expecting expert answers in any of these, but I do, I do hear lots of horror stories. I'm sure you do. So let's, can we bust a couple of myths now in terms of you, you, you know, if you're a sole trader, you'll pay less tax. And if you're a limited person, blah, what are some of these myths that are out there that just aren't true, Leslie, that we can blast through for people right now? So I think some of the, the key things is, is on the tax efficiencies and, and sort of where you choose your setup carefully um, mm. with your long-term view. So, you know, people kind of feel that sole traders are easier um, and, and in some senses they're simpler, but it's not an easy business. And, you know, every business you're going to have to work out whether you're a sole trader or a limited company. So, the, you know, the main sort of thing there is that it's, it's simpler to keep all your information, but you're not necessarily protected and you're not necessarily getting the best return on your time because as a sole trader, everything is taxed and subject to national insurance um, once you hit the thresholds. Whereas in other entities like the limited company, you've got so much more option mm. um, to, to kind of work with so that you end up with more money in your pocket. Yeah. Which at the end of the day, that's what everybody wants. They want to pay as little to the tax man and, and have more in their pocket. And I think, you know, it's understanding that you might pay a little bit more to, to have support running a limited company, but yeah. in comparison to how much more you can have in your pocket yeah. um, on the same levels of earnings. Yeah. It's, it is, I think it's educating people again in, in terms of how they do it. Um, yeah. Cause I think the tax is a scary round for a lot of people people won't speak to inland revenue because they think they're going to go to prison and you know, we're all too pretty to go to prison but i've always found them extremely helpful and you know i've i've made mistakes in business and i've picked up the phone and asked and they've guided supported me through and stuff because you don't know what you don't know until you know well, this it. is it and this is it and but to be honest we quite often say to our clients because hmrc's training is not always as good as it could be and it does depend who you speak to on the phone to what answer you get yeah put it down phone up again yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we quite well. often yeah we quite often say to our clients if you don't get the answer that you think is right or that you have an inkling towards put the phone down and ring back yeah and you'll get you'll get a more experienced person maybe third or fourth time um yeah. and and they'll be able to help you um, and answer your query so I think you know I think it is a is a sort of an interesting one but um, like yourself we deal with HMRC all the time so we say to clients look you pay us for this we'll deal with them on your behalf yeah. um, so you know if we come across any queries we'll sort it out we'll deal with them and then we'll just converse with you so that you don't have to deal with them mm. um, and you know a classic example of things that probably people should be aware of and especially when they're approaching an accountant to hire check their credentials we're not regulated we don't have to be qualified um, to say that we're an accountant anyone can operate as an accountant whether they've got a qualification or not yeah. um, we're not regulated like other industries in this country um, if you practice under a governing body, you're regulated. So I'm a member in practice under my professional body. So I'm regulated by my professional body. So which, what would those regulated, uh, re, oh, sorry, regulatory bodies be? Give us a couple of the names so people are listening. So you've got SEMA, which is the one I operate under. You've got AAT. You've got the ICAEW. 
you've got ACCA and yeah. they're kind of the the main accounting ones um, that you'll kind of see and then you've got the CIOT which is the Institute of Taxation um, yeah. which obviously some practices will have if they're sort of more tax specialists. Yeah. Is there any but, kind of hierarchy there Leslie in terms of which ones are better like a or is it just different bodies? It's different bodies. AAT is seen as a more tech technician um, style. Um, and usually they won't sign off on year end accounts. They'll just do all the technical stuff up to that point and then an accountant will review it. Yeah. Um, but they can sign off on accounts. There's nothing stopping them. And I know a few practices that are just run by people who are AAT qualified yeah. um, have never progressed it any further. Um, but because we're not regulated, there are a lot out there who don't know what they're doing. Right. And we've had a classic example, a client moved across to us. Um, we took on our year ends um, and we've, we've done those. I think we're just doing the second year now. The previous accountant wouldn't give us handover information. We got it after we'd submitted the first year. So we didn't have proper opening balances. So we had to kind yeah. of just submit based on a couple of sort of the year in action but when we hit furloughing schemes and all this kind of stuff the client came to us and said can you do the furlough for my staff we don't do payroll for them well we didn't at that point mm. um we said well, we can certainly look into it who does your payroll oh well i thought you did it i said well no because you didn't instruct us to do it we've not received any handover information from your previous accountant to say that they did it so it's not something that we'd ever discussed, mm. um, but we can do it. So we took it on. She couldn't furlough because she hadn't submitted a, an RTI in February. Right. Um, but we then found out that the previous accountant had done nothing. Wow. And we've had to go back six years and submit six years worth of PAYE. And this client has now got an astronomical bill yeah of which 30 percent of it is penalties and fees wow. um, which they've accumulated and the previous accountant has denied all knowledge to us that they ever did it but she's got emails and documentation from them proving that they did do something at some point um and, and we've had to sort out the whole mess and and it it, it grieves us you're 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 in business you're trying to win relationships and win trust and everything else and you're kind of delivering bad news with massive fines and threats of you know that because the, the bodies when they when they come down they come down hard right if they think well this is it this is it yeah and we've had a couple of of clients where we've we've had to sort things out and and yeah there's been issues and and other stuff that have come alongside it but i think um with running the business with my brother he's he's very diplomatic um, and he keeps the clients sort of fully aware of what's going on and what we're doing and how we're dealing with HMRC and what everything is sorted. And he go, you know, he'll say to them, okay, well, this is what they've come back to us with. However, we know that we can do a payment plan. So don't worry, you're not going to have to pay this all in one go. We'll talk to them and we'll work out a way to, to make this work. And, and we'll write letters to appeal all the penalties and the fines and everything else so that we can get it reduced as much as possible You're like a private investigator almost yeah yeah it does it does kind of become that you're kind of looking That's in it. every area but i think you know one of the things is that it's like just want people to have a bit more of a look you mm. may get recommended to someone but you know you need to do That's some right. due diligence you need yeah. to check them out um and i don't think ever in my whole six years of running a practice has anyone asked me for my certificates that's crazy ever that's crazy people just trust that you're an accountant yeah. so you must be regulated yeah you must be qualified it's insane so you're um i just want to jump back a second when you mentioned about the the the, the day you had in deloitte and that whole detective stuff <laughs> you know that rings so true in how i've got to know you in terms of your approach and i've referred business to you and every single time i have done it with the absolute trust and belief that you're going to get under the skin of where the problem lies not just try and cover it up and cure it you know you get to the cause of it so it, it's prevention 
as opposed to cure yeah in that sense and that's what i love about it and that's why i lovingly refer people to you because i know that even if it's coming with bad news even if there's stuff to sort out because they haven't been looked after previously well you won't just take it at face value and, and carry on with it which i've seen other people do you literally go stop the bus let's sort this out and then we'll figure out a way forward and that takes courage that's a bold move as i said when you're trying to build relationships but I love that authenticity and the way that you approach it, Leslie, because I think that's very rare. Yeah, but I think, you know, the reasons that we kind of have that approach is that if you don't sort it and you don't go back to the root problem, it'll end up biting you at some point. Yeah. Um, and actually, I think people are much more prepared to have something that takes a little bit longer to actually sort the issue mm. than to just skirt over it and think hope that it will go away yeah but that also rings true with something else i've seen with you is that your 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 attitude your outlook is the lifetime value of a customer not just to win to win the customer's accounts this year because if it was just for this year you don't have to go digging because well, no, exactly exactly but i think you know there's a prime example of that very recent um was one that you kind of referred to us um, where we had to sort out some issues that they thought had already been done. Um, and we could see where people had tried to paper over the cracks um, and then just posted journals to hope that that would clear it. Um, but it had then left a mess in other places, which then the, the next accountant wouldn't sign off on. Yeah. And it was kind of like, well, this, you know, I kind of got from the client, well, this should be easy. There shouldn't be much to do. Um, are you sure you need to charge that much? Um, and then kind of, I went back to her and said, you're missing a whole four months of transactions in the accounts. The first four months of transactions haven't been posted. I said, people have posted journals, which make absolutely no sense. I said, I need to clear all of that out and just post the four months. Yeah. And we did that, sorted it all out and it's clean. And it just means then you've got an easier thing to work with and now we've got the business we're you know we're taking that business on um to you've work with right. the you've earned the right and you've earned the you know you've got the permission to so well done mate because that's that's the difference yeah but in in essence as you say it, it's a lifetime of the client that you're looking at and it's the relationships mm. um and i think my training in hospitality has always been about developing relationships um and working well with people and and that's kind of comes across in in the practice i think i've always been the face of the business i've always been the one meeting the people yeah but i think it was jw marriott wasn't it in his book it's like it's the born to serve or the um yeah you know it's that whole kind of it's you it's a customer focused model yeah right? but it was a customer focused model with a focus on staff yeah. satisfaction yeah okay so they invested heavily in training so we and, and it was Marriott that I worked for in my year placement. Okay. So they invested heavily in the training of their staff. Yeah. To give them the confidence um, to deliver great guest satisfaction. Yeah, because he believed in every touch point, every yeah. single touch point was an extension of your brand, an extension of your service. And if you get yeah. it wrong anywhere, the whole thing's broken. Exactly. But we were traffic lights lighted. So, you know, the, the old school kind of traffic light thing. But if we got into the green, we got rewarded as a yeah. team. So, you know, he was very much in the sense of, well, if you're going to deliver and you're going to keep those standards high, then I'm going to reward you and, and celebrate that. You're delivering the vision of the business. You're delivering the business. You're delivering the operatives, yeah? the operations. Fantastic. Okay, cool. So, um, We've, we've touched on a few negative rumors and negative stories. I remember uh, one of my, it was my very first year in business and I did my, I did my um, accounts and I completed the form, the PDF form that was on the Inland Revenue HMRC site. And apparently the PDF doesn't work and it's never been taken down, but it doesn't work, so don't use it, was the advice I got given in the end. But that came off the back of, five envelopes arrived on the same day, totally in a £6,000 fine, um, which I had no idea about at all. And it, it, it basically stemmed from the, where I clicked back a couple of times on the PDF, it had randomly changed the dates of the submission 
and removed one day. So I did my accounts for 364 days of 365. And this was apparently a known anomaly of this PDF. But it's still up there because it takes it costs more to take it down was the answer I got. But you know, that whole pick up the phone and 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 speak yeah. to them. It was exactly that because I'm like, I am not paying six thousand pounds when I don't know why. What <laughs> and you can't explain it. And then one guy said, Oh, we have to get a tax inspector, he's gonna come around. And it was so threatening and so scary as somebody new in business. I was like, I've I've done everything right. So so that when when I felt like it was it, I got through to a human being in the end. And he basically said, have you used our PDF? And I said, yes. He said, don't, it's broken. And it was like, I now know where the problem lies. And, but, and it all went away. But it's quite scary when it goes wrong. Yeah. And, you know, when people, I find in business, I don't know if you associate with this, we abdicate stuff when we delegate. There's a big difference between the two. And I see people abdicating their accounts to software lately these days, where they just... Yeah. They think they're in control of their cash flow because they've got it in zero or QuickBooks or whatever. And it's like, as brilliant as those softwares are, if, if we're not looking at it, we're not in control. So No, exactly. And I think if, if you're not keeping up to date with the information, you're not in control either. No. The thing has got to be on the post, right? In terms of the forecasting, the decisions, where do you, it affects what money you spend on marketing, where you spend it, how many customers you, this is why I love working with you, Leslie, because you get all of that side of the commerciality of it, which is, you know. Well, as I say, you know, that comes from being in corporate world where yeah. you're having to deliver numbers and turn things around at month end within sort of like five, six working days um, to deliver to a board. Um, so it's, you know, it's crucial that you're on top of things and you don't leave everything till the end of the month. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you haven't got time to then. Exactly. Exactly. So what about, uh, it might seem a random question, what about this quarterly reporting, digital reporting and stuff like that that the, the government have talked about, played with, tried, tre tested, where are we at with that and is it happening and will it ever happen? I think it probably will happen. Yeah. They've done it in the sense of with, obviously they did payroll, suddenly went from you doing an annual return to everything is real time each month. Every yeah. time you submit a payroll, it's real time now. Um, whereas that used to be just once a year, you would reconcile it all and make sure everything was correct and submit to HMRC. Yeah. So they changed that. Um, they've changed the VAT. So that's more um, digital and connected. So previously you'd file them, but not a lot was done with them. It yeah. was kind of, it was all linked in. Whereas now it's like the real time of payroll is like the real time of the VAT um, and the software kind of when it links to something like QuickBooks or Xero, it, it looks and recognizes what you've submitted before and what you haven't. Um, if, if you've registered from the 15th of a month, it will only pull transactions from the 15th onwards, whereas you had to do a lot of manual intervention before. Yeah. Um, so Although people don't like it to a some extent when HMRC changed things, some of the things they've changed have made my life easier. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm not having to do manual intervention on a lot of things anymore. Yeah. Which is which is brilliant. It gives me time for other things. Yeah, um, I think it also gives us better peace of mind, gives us better control, makes makes or it should as business owners make us more up to date more aware of what's going on as well so there's got to be a win for us in that as well yeah no definitely and i think with the quarterly reporting i think that will be the same and i think what it will do is take away from people having to pay in advance on their tax so currently with the self-employed if you make over 1500 if you, you know sort of if you have to pay that amount in tax you pay a payment on account as well yeah um so you know everybody at the minute who's who's making a decent living is is paying tax in advance and i think yeah. if we get to quarterly reporting they'll pay the right amount of tax at the right time it will be spread throughout the year um and i think that will help a lot of people with budgeting you see so many people going into debt in january yeah. not just from christmas but from trying to find money to pay their tax bill yeah because they just haven't budgeted for it or they don't know what their figures are. So, you know, they don't know how much tax they're going to have to pay. Yeah. yeah and I think, I think this year is going to be even worse because the government have given everyone any money they've paid on account back to help them through this whole 
issue of lockdown and, and not trading and, and lots of other things. And then all of a sudden they're going to get whacked with a massive tax bill in January. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to hit them. be interesting to see. And, and, and again, uh, this, this probably leads on then to this question, which I will bring back in now is like, so why businesses of different sizes, industries and stuff for that, but why would people need your services in their lives? So I think, I think for a lot of people, they'll probably say, you know, when they first start up, I don't need an accountant. Um, why I can't afford an accountant. Yeah. And I think sort of our viewpoint is, well, if you get us from the beginning, we can make sure that you've got the right processes in place, that you're able to pay yourself a salary from the word go, you're able to afford our fees from the word go, um, cover all your costs and grow a healthy business. Yeah. Um, so the an example, we've got a new client coming on board. We've deferred their fees for three months because they literally are at a standing start. Yeah. Um, so we've said to them, look, we'll get you set up. We'll get everything in place and you pay us in three months. And then you pay us on a monthly retainer from month four onwards. Um, so yeah. there are lots of things. There are lots of things that, you know, people just need to ask the question. Yeah. Um, because in essence, once you've got an established firm like we have, where we've got our regular income coming in, we can afford to do that for a few clients mm -hmm. if they're brand new startups. Yeah. Um, and it just, you know, it makes it easier. And if they've got the right systems in place, it makes it easier for them to run the business. Yeah. I hear so many times that people get caught up in the admin and everything else that they're not actually then making any money. Yeah. <laughs> they're spending their whole time worried about the finances and and the administration of it well if you prioritize things at the beginning you wouldn't have that issue and you'd be able to get out there and earn the money and everything else would look after itself yeah yeah totally i love that so let, let's come back to your you, you as a business owner then for a second um so what setbacks have you had and how have you overcome them? So I think probably my biggest setback, um, when I started in practice, I came out of a job where I was the main owner in the house. Yeah. Um, so we took a massive cut for me to start my business. I had to have a part-time job that ran alongside it while I started, because I started from a standing start. I didn't have a client when I started and set up. Um, and it wasn't until I, one of my children was at school that I started to make networks and yeah. started to sort of regularly get inquiries. Um, and then obviously networking sort of helped as well. So a big setback for us was getting across that financial um, I don't know, gap really, which it was. And I suppose three years in, I'd got back up to my salary level. Um, so it took, took a little while. Um, but then I merged with someone and my salary dropped massively. Yeah. Um, and the sort of review process of all that happened within that 18 months of working with that one person was realizing that I needed to have my finger on the pulse mm. because the business grew and grew and I was bringing new clients in every week. Um, so there was no shortage of work really and no shortage of reason that we shouldn't be billing um, a decent amount of money every month. Mm. But I took my finger off the pulse, left someone else in charge of running the office um, and would just say yes to things in terms of hiring new people. I would just say, yeah, well, I'd think, well, they obviously have looked at the numbers and think that we can afford it. And then I'd kind of see that at the end of the month, there wasn't enough money to pay me. Mm. I'd pay everybody else and nothing for me. Right. Um, and then obviously the stresses come with that and the yeah. credit card debt comes with that and loans come with that because you're trying you to try and ride the storm, right? Yeah. You try and ride the storm and think, Oh, it'll get better next month. It'll get better next month. Yeah. And you know, it doesn't until you kind of either you hit the brick wall, which was what happened with me. Yeah. Um, or you step out of it, assess it with someone else who's completely outside of it and have to make drastic changes. 
Um, unfortunately for me, it was hitting the brick wall um, in that, you know, my business partner decided to walk away and suddenly I was left trying to hold something together. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until someone said to me, are you sure your health is worth this? Mm. And at that point, I kind of realized actually the business is, is, it's not about the business. People work with me because they want to work with me, yeah. not because they want to work with that business, that brand. Yeah. And it took probably the hardest decision of my life to walk away and to just leave it in some senses to just rot. Yeah. Because that's kind of because the other partner wouldn't take any ownership for the business. Um, and it was tough. Yeah. But I think it's taught me a lot in the sense of I know how much I'm capable of doing. I've got good support around me. Um, got the opportunity to work with my brother, which had never been on the cards. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're, we're billing more than we were billing at the height of that business. And I had six employees then. Now there's me full time and two part timers. And I'm billing the same. Brilliant. So, you know, we didn't need the resource. It was just the organizational of the work wasn't being done. Yeah, it's it's mad. It never feels like it at the time, but things really do happen for a reason, don't they? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. There's countless times I can look at it in my life and go, I don't think I'm going to make it through this, but I do. And we do. And we're still here and we come out of it better, sharper, <laughs> you know, learning. Well, this is it. And I think, you know, for a lot of people, it's you've got to take the learnings. And I think now I kind of, I am a person that thinks my glass is always half full. Mm. I'm always looking at the positives. Yeah. Um, I will always remember, that, Leslie, the day that you said, I want to come to strategic planning. And I remember like, are you sure? <laughs> and, and I know, I know we have a safe environment. I pride ourselves on the fact that we have a safe environment and it's a community and we support each other and that, and it's, those aren't just words, it's meant, but having gone through the conversations that we went through at that time, it took a huge amount of courage for you to come and stand in a room full of your peers and go, this is what I do in a professional body. And this is where I'm at. And you had to just get it all off and then start to rebuild it. And it was a, a pretty momentous moment in, in that journey in terms of you facing it. And I'll always remember the courage that it took for you to do that. And I salute you and I, it's huge kudos for you having the ability to just rebuild it the way you did. And I think a massive testament to that is the people that have come to work with you. And so the, the, the time frame that it's taken you to get yeah. bigger than you were before is, is exactly a testament to how you operate. So, yeah. And I think, you know, I had to take those difficult steps and I knew the quicker I took those difficult steps, the quicker things would move and the quicker things would change. Mm. Um, and I, I wasn't prepared to be that person that just cowered away from sort of what had happened. It was, it was a case of, I needed to face it head on. Yeah. And yeah, it wasn't easy. I mean, I, you know, I had medication to help with that. Mm. Um, and that was amazing, but you know, it's, it's being, being real and I think by showing people that you're human, mm. I think that does kind of give a completely different feel to how you run a business. Yeah. Um, and the fact that 80% of the clients who were in the old business came across to the new business and are still in the new business, just, you know, it kind of concreted that for me yeah. in terms of being able to move forward. 100% mate, it speaks, it speaks huge volumes for, for how you set it up in terms of the relationships initially and yeah. how you, as I said earlier and, and I and I meant it when I said it how you dealt with the, the the challenges with grace and dignity right the way through so with all of that with all of that happened and happening and the growth somebody's considering starting a business today what what one piece of advice would you give them who if they're thinking of taking that leap of faith to do their own thing I'd say if you're going to regret that you didn't do it, you need to do it. <laughs> Whether it fails or you 
have the biggest success whatever I think I think I would always regret if I hadn't have given it another go yeah because I could have quite easily gone back to being employed and getting a job yeah because it always feels like an easy option uh, even though even though deep down we know if we've gone through the process of being unemployable we how will we ever go back to work for somebody else you know yeah but it feels like oh it's an easier option even for the short term yeah, so okay cool um so if you feel you regret it do it anyway i think yeah and i think that's the same with everything in life yeah you know otherwise you just have a you get to the end of life and you think oh, i wish i'd done that oh, i wish i'd done that yeah and i think you know that there's lots of things that we want to do as a family and i'm kind of like right well let's just get on and do it yeah yeah absolutely love that that's, that's a, a real sort of ethos for life i love that um so interestingly i've heard the, the question about the company how you how you see your company and potentially your industry uh in the future you now i've heard people talk about the uh digitalization of of tax and accounting meaning bookkeepers and accountants are going to become extinct you know and I've heard others, well, others saying, well, we've always had to diversify and we should have, those that are going to become extinct deserve to become extinct. <laughs> but how do you see, as somebody in the industry, how do you see first the industry, the future of it, and then the future of your company? I think the industry as a whole has, has definitely moved massively. Yeah. Um, and I think business owners, now that they've got software that kind of, does do a lot of the stuff for them yeah we're more geared now to advisory business support um planning uh, reporting and all those kind of things so i think if you would kind of taken the viewpoint that you would deliver on those anyway it's just yeah. a shift into a different service area which yeah. you know we do already anyway um so we do a lot of reporting for people and I do a lot of advisory stuff and I kind of become that first port of call. People will now, my clients will ring me first and ask me the question um, and then I will point them in the right direction or help them if I can, if it's something that I can deal with. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I don't think we'll become extinct. Well, not yet anyway. Yeah. Um, I think it's just accepting the fact that you're, you need to be up to date with stuff that's going on, reading lots of different stuff so that you find new tools and new things to sort of give your clients yeah. to, to make it easier and more straightforward for them to run a business. Yeah, more effective. You know, I, 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 I love software. You know that I'm a bit of a geek in, in, in that sense, but I love nothing more than the human being explaining to me how that works and why this works. And uh, that's why I feel there's accountants, good accountants that add value that, that are those trusted advisors should always be having, you know, what's coming around the corner. A big part of what you should be doing with us in the, is, is how, you, how are you gearing up for some of these reg, uh, regulation changes or whether it be a, a tax change or whatever, or just how do we gear up better for, from a cash flow from a forecasting point of view? all of that added value stuff yeah which you're just never going to get from software no and this is it and i think every client's different so we'll have some clients who we we don't do much advisory for at all and they are our once a year kind of contact drop mm. stuff off and and we produce the information for them um, and then we have others who hate technology. Yeah. So every time the government says you've got to do this through software or this, that, and the other, they like, they ring us up and say, you can do that for us though, can't you? And we're like, yep. yep. So, you know, some of them, we have software set up that some of our clients never even look at, but we input all their information on it to yeah. be able to do their VAT returns and yeah. their tax returns, but they you never look at it. You also do work with charities as well, don't you? Yeah, so we've got a couple of charities. So um, we work with um, one that we picked up from Stroudnet, which was yeah. their recognised charity at the time. Um, yeah. And we still work with them. And um, because Great. we work with them, we got recommended to another charity, which is potentially going to end up being our biggest client. And we don't do year-end accounts for them. Why? 
So we do monthly reporting for them, for the board. Um, we're going to be taking on their payroll um, and we're going to be doing quarterly forecasting for them. Um, we're basically going to be their in-house finance function. Which is brilliant, right? And that, yeah. the amount of charities that need that and not just, you know, not just the really, really established guys, but the, the, the kind of mid range that they're, they're, they're past that point of existing, they're in that space of growing. Yeah. And really then get to that next stage up and the longevity then of that charity and the good that they're doing. Yeah, exactly. And actual controls in place, don't they? And not yeah, just- Yeah, exactly. Uh, and the stupid minutes, thing is, but... we can't do the year end for them. No. Because I'm not an auditor. Yeah. I can't do year end for charities, but we can do everything else. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the things that was lovely about this new charity that we're working with, we sent over our proposal terms of engagement. Now we have our standard TNCs, which is really small print, cram it onto two pages and, and that goes over as a separate document. But the proposal, they came back and said, that is the nicest, simplest, joy to read proposal with terms that we have ever had. She said wow. it was a joy to sign it. <laughs> There's that, right? <laughs> and I was like, I've never, never had that. Do you know right. what I mean? And it was just really nice to get some feedback on something that we designed. Yeah. But that was simple, but had everything in it. Yeah. Fantastic. I love that. Absolutely love that. That's, that's some marketing gold in that, right? <laughs> yeah, I think joy. so. It was a joy <laughs> to sign your terms and conditions. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Okay. So in terms of um, a couple of questions and out of the business now, going back to you, Jen. What, what are you reading? Uh, what are you listening to right now? What are you reading at the moment, Leslie? So I've just been rereading Profit First because um, yeah. I was trying to get sort of back up to speed and have it fresh in my mind for delivery on a on couple of workshops. Yeah. Um, so I sort of reread some sections of that. Um, the other one, I'm going to have to load it up because I can never remember um, what it's called. But it was it's one actually that I think Chris recommended to Wendy within the yeah. group and um I thought oh I'll give it a go and 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 see what it's like and it's called the four disciplines of execution okay and it's just brilliant in the way that it talks about four stages yeah who's that by so interesting uh it's by Sean Covey and yeah. Chris McChesney yeah okay cool we'll put a link up to that when we share this and stuff so and to profit first as well the, the, the book. yeah which is you know one of my go-to books and the other one that i love and kind of inspires me for sort of my longevity and not working 70 80 hours a week is my five day weekend book oh well, that was my next question which is which is your go-to for self-development i think you've nailed it because you love that book don't you you absolutely love i it. love that book i love that book and it is very heavily property um led in yeah. that you invest in property and it gives you sort of income and you can kind of come take a step back in terms of what sort of levels of management you put in into that but i think you can apply it across the board mm. um in terms of business and you know it just kind of said to me that i need to look at other revenue streams i can't just focus on the business because that just becomes all consuming um and i need to have that time away from the business as well because i'm yeah. so much better when i've had some time off when i come back to the business with fresh ideas and you know you've had time to think and process things yeah um so i just kind of think you know yeah that's that is kind of one of my go-to books that i go back to time and time again and think oh okay what can i do next yeah um, to kind of get a little bit closer to this I, I absolutely love it. I don't, the, the, the time out stuff, you know, I, I know if I don't meditate and I don't read regular, I turn into an even bigger knob than I am normally. You know, and it's, but it is that kind of, I you need that reset. And I, yeah. there's an escapism in reading a book. There's a reset and there's, there's time out to myself that, and I'm sure you feel this, you, you put a lot of time and effort with your clients. You give a lot of yourself and your energy and your knowledge and your experience. And, you know, if we don't, do that for ourselves regular enough and we don't find that top up you know listen that's what i'm saying listening to the podcast i listen to and, and creating these podcasts it's about giving people 
I think Darren Hardy talks about it in the Success Magazine, where he interviewed loads of successful leaders for years, and he said success leaves clues. So that's why I yeah. love reading books, because if someone's made the mistakes before, if I learn from them, I don't have to make the same mistakes myself. Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, that's that's kind of the thing with Profit First was just eye-opening yeah. in that, you know, he reveals so much in that book yeah. so that you don't have to make the mistakes. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? Absolutely brilliant. So um, you're, is it four-day weekend or five-day weekend? Five-day weekend. Five-day weekend. Five weekend, yeah. So that's your go-to for self-development then? Yeah. Um, okay. So finally, before um, we finish off, we, what we will do is we will share links uh, for your contact information, Leslie, in terms of um, YouTube channels, Instagrams, all your social holdings, your website and all that sort of stuff. But to anyone listening or watching this that has a question, uh, maybe it's a question that they just want to ask you genuinely or uh, a question about some of the things we've discussed today. What's your preferred route? How would you prefer that they reach out to you and get hold of you? Um, so probably the easiest is to either drop me an email or to send me a, a message through Facebook because um, we obviously have our business page on there. So, yeah. you know, that's quite, quite easy. To be honest, clients contact me in such a variety of ways. I'll have WhatsApp messages, I'll have messenger messages, yeah. text messages, emails, phone calls, and I kind of get used to which method works for that client. And then I will use that method as our contact. Love that. Excellent. So basically they can communicate with you the way that they want to. Yeah. Love that. Well, it's better to have them comfortable. I think a lot of people are frightened to go to their accountant as it is. So if you suddenly make it really difficult to get in contact with you or you use a method that they hate, yeah, then you're going to be starting off on the wrong foot from the word go. Yeah, completely. But how many companies do it, right? They just get into it's our way or the highway. Yeah, and I must admit, sort of during this sort of lockdown time and, and having this change, picking up the phone has been the preferred method. Yeah. People want to talk. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's mad, isn't it? We feel more connected even though we can't physically meet and stuff. There's so many yeah. things that we're able to connect with and through now that I think somebody said the other day, we've, we've moved forward in 10 weeks further than we have in the last 20 years in terms of technology and business and our embracing of that technology more so. And I think in communication, I think we've finally realized that actually email is quite not offensive, but it's not, it's, it's ineffective. Not, it's, and it's not a relation, a relational way to communicate. No. Well, if you look at the history of it, it never was, it was memos on notice boards. And you'd have a notice board in every room uh, of a factory or an office room. And when you, you have to print out 20 memos and go and pin them up and suddenly you've got memo pinned on memo, pinned on memo, pinned on memo. It's like, which one's up today then? You know, and, it, it, and emails was meant to evolve that. And it really hasn't. <laughs> it's just, no. And people say, well, put some inboxes together, file them in your, now I've got like loads of, oh, so you know how much I detest email <laughs> because I find keyboard warriors hide behind them. And it's like, pick up the phone, send me a message, have a conversation, be a human, communicate and communicate yeah. as best as you can and put the tonality in there. That's e even why like emoticons and stuff and emojis have become so popular because yeah. they put a little bit of tonality and personality into what is flat text that can be yeah. read so many different ways, right? Exactly. This is it. It can be interpreted in so many different ways. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, listen, I've, I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. So before we finish, is there anything else you'd like to add? Any nuggets that you'd like to give our listeners before we kind of wrap things up? I think probably one of the things I would kind of recommend to people is to read. Um, I didn't really get into sort of reading self-development or those kind of books until sort of about two, two, three years ago. Um, and I set aside time every day to read 10 pages of a, an instructional book or a self-development book. And I think it's had a massive impact. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I think people underestimate the power of the written word. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan, you know, yourself. And I, people, the audio books are great for me. They, they're, good, they're great at top-ups. But I love the smell of a book and the escapism of a book and the kind of sitting in a comfy chair and switching the world off and reading a book. That's what I love. And I properly take it in then. And yeah, I've always said like a business book or a self-help book is on average 11 chapters. 
and it takes on average 15 minutes to read a chapter. It's like, so I challenge people to give me 15 minutes out of your 48 hours, read one chapter every two days. You'll read two books a month. Yeah. You know, but in a year, that's a game changer. In terms massively, massively. Exponential knowledge, growth and stuff like that. So yeah, fantastic. Okay. So listen, just before we finish off, I would uh, genuinely, and I mean this from the, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Leslie, because uh, oh, thank you for being honest. You know, you've shared some real, um, some real honesty with us. It's been fun. Um, for you, I hope, uh, as painless as it has been for me, because you, you never know with these interviews how they're going to go. But thank you, because you've made it painless. So my mission is to get a, a little under the skin with people behind the scenes in companies. Uh, because in the main, a lot of people assume that we can be un, unreachable. And from my experience, that's just far from the truth. So I believe wholeheartedly that there are brilliant stories in each of us and we never know who that's going to impact and what part of our story is going to have that impact. So if we can bring those stories out to the leaders in business of what's behind the business and how people resonate with it. And, and if it triggers that question or triggers that reason to, to reach out and contact and ask the question and improve and develop, then this is going some way to serve a purpose that I wanted it to when we, we started this. So uh, thank you to our listeners and subscribers and stuff as well. But more importantly, Leslie, thank you to you for giving us the time, your knowledge and your experience. So You're thank welcome. you very much. And um, one other quick thing. I know it might be cheeky to request it as we're live still recording, but you may have seen Maverick Minds in the background there. What I would like to do is maybe invite you back on a different day where we have different minds. So we have a Maverick Minds is all about getting debate going with people with not polarized, but sometimes different viewpoints and stuff. So we can get some real discussions going to educate people in different ways. I'm almost like panels of interview as opposed to a one to one. Yeah. I'm, I'm not doing it to get heated conversations of people walk out, but I would like to get that spectrum of conversation going and debate. Is that something you'd be up for? I give it a go. <laughs> Fantastic. Brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Okay, cool. So thanks ever so much again and uh, look forward to catching up again with you soon. Cheers, Adam. <laughs>